Hello, uh, you're all very welcome. We're here today to preview the big one, the final of this year's Champions Cup. And I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by former Grand Slam winner Gordon Darcy and John O'Sullivan, sports writer um, with the Irish Times, who I'm sure is grinning from ear to ear. John, you'll have to rein it in a bit, but we'll give you we'll give you a moment to gloat. You called a monster win and they came up trumps. Yes, um, they were less happy with uh, a piece I wrote on Monday. But yes, I did before the match manage to eventually, after a lot of procrastination, <laughs> think and come down on their side in terms of winning. I think obviously in a 16-15 game, you're going to, there's, both sides are going to reflect on how they could have won the match and both sides could have won the match. But I thought Munster were deserving winners based on the 80 minutes um, and worthy, worthy finalists. Yeah, Gordon, it was a fantastic game of rugby. The atmosphere was brilliant. And um, although Munster were deserving winners, you could look at it from the other side as well. Leinster came so close. Both teams played really well. And it was an amazing occasion. Yeah, the danger of being patronising was rugby was the winner. It was a really... <laughs> you know more fortune cookie stuff. Plenty of, uh, plenty of controversy, uh, you know, across it. Munster probably thinking they could have had a bonus point by you know by the by the time the game finished and um, getting the ball uh, robbed three times on the on the line and Leinster you know despite all of that um were winning the game with four minutes to go um and gave Munster two bites of the cherry to have the ball back instead of managing it out so um you look at the impact of the bench um being a key difference, I think. And Guy, I was I was kind of wondering, it was like, you know, would they have gone with Joey Carberry and Scandal played? And he was brilliant when he came on. Absolutely. Really awesome. Absolutely fantastic. And you look at the number of offloads they played, 23, I think, against four for Leinster. Um, but just the lack of composure in the final final third of the field and the final four minutes cost them. But geez, they still had to go 80 meters, which was I was watching it going. There's no way. And yeah. then they then they did. It was brilliant. And Crowley, again, you got to take your hat off to Crowley as well. He was clearing a rook two phases before the drop goal. Yeah. Yeah, I must say, I, I um I'm not going to I'm not going to look any more smug than I already do here, having mentioned Jack well, last so week. We'll give you your moment, Crowley. You you were backing him last week. Yeah, no, I thought I thought he was great. I thought he stepped up and, and it would have been it was an interesting day for him because he was started obviously at inside center. And Ben Healy himself and Ben Healy had done very well. Uh, they alternated at first receiver. In fact, Jack Cody played a lot of first receiver when Ben Healy was on the pitch. But there was uh, they brought a fluency and, uh, and a width to the way Munster wanted to play. And they played with very, very good tempo. And then when Ben Healy went off, um, the challenge for, for Jack Cody at that stage was to manage the game. He was now in and out half. And he did so. And quite apart from his drop goal, there were other instances when his range of passing his choice of passes was just impressive he just he did he did well in the game situation uh where he could and uh i think it's heartening for munster and for him um with ben leaving during the summer that he produced a performance like that in a game of that nature when his team needed him and and he stepped up when his team needed him in every sense i loved his rod like wag of the finger when he I, got if he just got both, if he'd done it with both arms in the air, it would have yeah. been perfect. They could have superimposed <laughs> Wales. But it's brilliant. And although Leinster won't look at this defeat in a positive light, it's brilliant for Irish rugby that this rivalry has really sparked to life again because you do need two competitive teams for this rivalry. And it has been dominated by Leinster for the past few years. Yeah. And I think as well how Raintree has won the. He's got the changing room in behind him and they are well coached and they're not they're not overly prescriptive of it. Um they still have a long way to go. Um, which is which is really good. They've you know those who've beaten Leinster, but their room for growth in this type of new game plan yeah. is uh is 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 there. And Crowley is likely to well, should be nailed on as their number one next year. So they will they will they will need to grow and to to get to get better with it i suppose what they did in that final 4 minutes imagine if they were doing that for you know 20 minutes 26 27 minutes in a in a, in, a, in a game with, with their possession and that really makes it uh, makes it interesting um i think they'll be really really happy with having the couple of uh, having the extra week um because it gives them a little bit of distance from that because you can see the emotion and i was looking at them going oh they've really celebrated this one but they needed to 
you got to celebrate those wins because it means something. But now they've got a week to kind of decompress and get a few get a, a few really important bodies back and mount that challenge for, for, for next week. Yeah, that's it. They were missing key players. A lot has been said about Leinster's team selection, but you have to give Munster credit as well. They were missing the likes of Murray and um, Snyman and a few players like that who would have made a huge difference. So you could look at it from their perspective. They could have won by more, John, and maybe should have won by more. They left a few chances out there. Yeah, I think certainly, and, and, and Gordon touched on it in the first half, they had three really good opportunities uh, where they were dispossessed, we'll say, pretty close to the Leinster line. Had they converted one or two of those, they would have established that break on the scoreboard that would have allowed them to relax, probably play even more. And they played a lot of, of really good rugby and they played a lot of rugby. I think that was the other thing. Like we spoke last week about Munster having courage to play the game and they had plenty of courage and they did play and they, they weren't uh, content just to kick the ball and they continued to play rugby during that time. I think in that end game, um, they showed the, the difference between uh, panic and urgency. So they never panicked. They were There was an urgency to what they did, which was brilliant. But they had, they retained a level of composure that even though it looked a little bit helter-skelter, there was method to what they were doing. And they did rely on individuals, which you have to do in those circumstances, to make good decisions and good plays. And all of those came together to facilitate them getting 80 metres up the pitch to create a platform. And then you need your... When you make that decision to drop back into the pocket, then you need your at half to step up and Jack Crowley stepped up. But I thought the the preamble, if you like, to, to creating that platform was first class. I thought they they managed it as well as they could in an environment where it was hectic and you you had to, you know, in terms of passing, clearing out rocks, decisions, uh, carrying ball into contact, moving it away, all of those things were, you know, 80%. And you also need a little bit of luck in those circumstances it's 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 not chess you can't just move pawns around you know there's um there's huge physical contact and you've got to you've got to finish on the right side of uh maybe two or three occasions where it's it's pretty touch and go as to uh getting the ball back or you know being able to do what you want to do yeah their transformation this season has been exceptional we spoke about it last week they really believe in their ability and the game plan that they're playing that the coaches have implemented the players seem to really enjoy it and they have clarity about what they need to do and what um, what they can do. In, and I suppose you you touched on it there, Gordon, and um, the coaching staff have to take a lot of the credit because the core group of players hasn't really changed since Van Graan has left. John hit it there as well. The composure, no one panicked. I, Leinster were incredibly naive and giving them two opportunities to 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 get to basically to have the ball two turnovers one from Coombs and Munster kicked it back to them they ran it back and then just a series of unfortunate as you know you're watching it and uh you know Thomas Larkson running a line that never needed to be ran and uh Nick McCarthy picking a 10% pass over a nice easy one to go in behind Larkson to uh to Joe McCarthy so they give them, they give over the ball. But that's you know that's only one thing. You know, Leinster switch into defence and they're a little bit disjointed. But the reaction from Scannell and Hodnett, and Hodnett's involved twice in that build in that build up play. But it's all they're in control of everything there. So one of the things that I think has massively changed for Munster is their attitude to making mistakes, and it's almost it's it's a little bit of a. Uh, it's a, it's a, it can be a little bit of a hard one to get right with players. It's almost paradoxical where you encourage them to make more mistakes. So they have that freedom and they give off that. Uh, they don't they don't worry about the, mis- the mistake because in order to be able to get those offloads, you have to be willing to make the mistake as much as get the as get it. And they, that's finally clicked for them. Um, and I think there was probably three or four offloads in that final phase. Um, and Leinster just couldn't win the win the gain line on on any of them um and at a certain point in the season and it just happened to be this game for Munster and that's unfortunate for Leinster but you know hopefully they will learn something from it but that they um their moment came at that and all of that season came together in that passage of play which was absolutely fantastic to, to say to for them to see because in your Graham Rantry now and you're Prendergast and you're sitting there and you're going, you're building up for the heading out of the Stormers. This is our defence. 
this is what we do. We turn over the ball. This is what we do when we have the ball. It's there. We've seen it. We've done it. Now believe in it. And we have to do, we have to repeat it more often. What do you think the biggest changes, John, in their performance over the past few months? Because there has been a switch really since if we were to pinpoint a game where things started to change for them against South Africa when that big, huge game for the youngsters down in Cork. I think it's a little bit of, of uh, the patterns betting in. I think it's a little bit of individuals playing really well. Like, one person who was missing the last day and who's moving on, obviously, to Benetton at the end of the season is Malachi Fekatoa. If you look at his influence in Munster's, we call it revival, in inverted commas, um, in terms of their performances and results, and but the way they've played, he's had a, he's been a huge uh, factor in that. He's been a catalyst. He is playing like the the player who was an All Black at one stage. He's, uh, you know, he's been very, very good. His partnership with Anton Frisch in the centre has been excellent, and it has given. Munster a stability and an attacking edge there as well. Calvin Nash has been outstanding all season. Connor Murray has brought a composure and has been a very good foil for Jack Crowley when he's played there, has kind of brought that maturity and game management. And then RG Snyman coming back. So I think a number of individuals that have come back into the team and a, a number of players that have kind of played their way into form has been one thing. And it touches, to touch on Gordon's point there, is that you know, you've got to give Graham Rantry and Mike Prendergast a huge amount of credit. Andy Kiriakou, Dennis Leamy, obviously, with the, the defence side of things. But you can see that Munster players are encouraged to play. And what they've ha had, if you like, during that run is the courage to offload, to play, to try things without recrimination. You can imagine that, that the video reviews are, OK, fine, if you're going to try something, Try and make sure that your percentage wise, it's not a kind of 10% or 20% chance of coming off. And they're not doing that, but they are taking risks. Now, to take those risks, you have to work on your skill sets. And that's another thing that I think is very noticeable with the players. Some of the players have worked very hard to upskill. And you can see that in, in the way they play the game in terms of offloads, in terms of decision making, choices. Uh, and I think that's very, very heartening from a Munster perspective going forward. Yeah, they're encouraged to play, but they are also, they also know at the end of it that form will be rewarded. They're not afraid um, to make those changes and players know that if they're not informed, that they will be dropped. And I suppose that competition, um, it, is, it has been something Leinster have done for years, Gordon. Um, but you see with Joey Carberry being dropped and then Ben Healy coming back in, um, Connor Murray after he was dropped you know the way he came back in and the maturity he showed um, to come back in and to, to play to his the way he has been playing playing back in form again and um, so that has to be a factor as well yeah and I think that's, that's going to be tested uh, in you know a little over eight days time there are some big decisions to be made um, in that uh, in that squad uh, Casey was good who do you start there and you know, even across in the in the twenty three, there will be you know what the makeup of that team. How do you find? Because this is always the it's easy when there's plenty of games. When you're down to the last game of the season. What do you reward? Do you do you reward form or do you reward the the talent? Um, but one of the things that's just to touch on there, what John was saying is you can see even from their lines of running. And one of the things I was impressed with with Crowley was he just holds the ball up and lets a lot of people run their lines but they're coming so late onto the ball they are clearly been working on that and practicing it and it's really really hard to defend and Leinster struggled with it um for a lot of the uh for a lot of, uh for a lot of the game and that's so when you're talking about practicing the skills it's not just you know going out and throwing 100 passes or you know throwing 100 offloads they're obviously doing it in a really constructive and have been building on strong foundations from the start of the season and it's just starting to mature and starting to come to fruition at the right time in the in in the right season and it's the last time Leinster will ever be able to gamble on selection in a knockout game, I think. Yeah, the teams are in. Well, the teams are in. So we just before yeah. we go to teams, if we look at the, the performance, if we touch on it from a Leinster's point of view, what will they take from that? Because it will be a much changed side, but I suppose what elements of their performance will they be most frustrated with? I think the fact that, I think it's, it's a kind of positive negative, if you like. Um, they will get to look, examine the performance. They'll be able to examine the what they were trying to do in terms of the game plan and what they were able to do and where they fell short. And I think to for any team, for any group of players, you need in defeat, you've got to learn lessons. So what are the lessons that Leinster learned from this? Well, that that 
Uh, some of the performances weren't up to the level that they needed them to be, um, that the collective wasn't as good as it might have been, that they still came close. Um, but at the same time, also examining the depth of the uh, of the playing group as well. And um, I think for them, for them to take any positive out of what was a negative for them, that they have to learn those lessons. They've got to, they've got to have, they've got to take something from this and they've got to ensure that they don't repeat it either in terms of the way they play or in terms of some of the players or where they need to move or what they need to work on. Can I just go forward to put that into context? They clearly prioritize the champions cup. So yeah. it will, it, the, the question to answer so we're going to get on to the Leinster bit in a while. We need to have a quick chat about Connacht as well. But will it will the end justify the means if they finish at six o'clock or whatever six thirty in the in the Aviva with the Champions Cup? Will it be worth it then? Yeah, because it's easy in hindsight to say that the gamble that Leo took didn't pay off. But Leinster still had, I think, about thirteen internationals in their side and. Um, you know, they didn't play badly and a lot of individuals stood out, I think, from that performance as well. But you spoke about it last week, Gordon. It's probably the lack of game time for the combinations. That might have been what was a bit off because individually they're playing well. But um, when you don't have that continuity with these combinations, that's probably where where Munster were able to take advantage of that. But then also as well, like, there was definitely an eye on the Champions Cup where Munster had two eyes firmly on this and you have to kind of go like this was, Munster were waiting in the long grass and they did it, they did it brilliantly. Um, they had to snatch a victory from the jaws of defeat and they did it. And I say it, we just have to, we would just, I think we have to, because Leinster do have another game, I think we have to kind of go, right, let's see what they were, what they were doing with that. Yeah, uh, Connacht, yeah. you predicted a win for them last week, John, and they threw everything at the game but maybe even though they had a really strong start, um, which you were hoping for, their game management might have let them down. And you'd have to say the better team won. Yeah, no, I think that's all fair. I think they got the perfect start to the game. I mean, if you were asking them beforehand, would you like to be eight, 10 points up? They were eight points up. Uh, you were So from that perspective, um, it would have gone as well as they would have hoped at the very start. Then they had to manage the game from that point on. And it was just the number of unforced errors that allowed the Stormers to get back into the game, both in terms of field position so, and then soft tries, more mistakes, you know, compounding each error with another one. And uh, then fighting and scrapping to get back into the game, then making more mistakes and, and often not under huge pressure. Like there were mistakes that were kind of pretty basic and, I would say careless uh, on occasion. And that that is very hurtful when you're scrapping away and scrapping away and you're undermining yourself basically with your own, if you like, collective performance and individual performance within that. It's it's kind of, it's very difficult against the defending champions in their backyard. So yes, the Stormers deserve to win. I was just really disappointed for Connacht because I thought that they went down and they started with purpose and intensity and everything that you'd want them to start with they got they they got their reward and then they just unraveled and that was really disappointing and i think a lack of leadership at times and and sometimes they relied on individuals rather than the you know individuals played extremely well and and battled really hard to keep them in the game but you know kind of key decision makers not so much they just made too too many mistakes isn't that what always happens with connacht since they won in what did they win 2016 or 2015 yeah 16 yeah they, and even this second half of this season, they can put a string of games together, but ultimately they all unravel. They always come a, come a cropper. It's that, it's like they're continually outperforming and they just seem one or two players shy of a bit more, a bit more strength and depth in kind of key positions. Um, yeah. You know, the, Definitely. the over, the, there's a, and I, I think on a leadership, I think on a game management and even just personnel, I think there's an over reliance on Jack Carty, and when he doesn't perform, he has an off day. You have no, they have no chance because they have no should option. They, should they look at, you know, giving David Hawkshaw the reins or Kyle Ford or what do you think Pete Wilkins will do? I mean, it's a very, it's a very hard thing to do. Jack Carty has been a servant for Connacht, and he is 
um, when he's on form, he plays brilliantly. And um, I suppose he's captain as well. So it is a very difficult decision to make. But do you think they should maybe look at another out half? I think I think Pete Wilkins needs to sit down the three people that you've mentioned and make a decision and just explain to them what he expects from the team and how he's going to pick on form. I think that's the most important thing. And Gordon might touch on this briefly as a as a former player. I think if you understand that your place in the team is based on how you play, not what you've done in the past, then I think you can accept that a coach makes a decision to play players in matches. I think when you're still harping back to what a player has done in the past and you're ignoring, ignoring a little bit of current form, that it's very difficult for the younger players in those circumstances to turn around and be philosophical about not being picked. I think that Peter, Pete Wilkins has to be fair to them all. So I think he's got, it, it's very interesting to see what he does at the start of next season. But I think if he doesn't, the frustration, I think, grows for players when they feel that they're not being given a fair chance and consistently being given a fair chance when they're playing well. And I think that's what uh, Peter has to concentrate on, if you like, next year across a number. It's not just at out half. There are a number of positions there in the team where, you're looking and saying, yeah, okay, is it between form or, you know, kind of what you've done in the past? And I think he's got maybe three or four of those decisions to make. And I think it'll be it'll be interesting for the group because for the morale of the group as well, people can understand, people are never happy when they're left out, but they, they can understand why somebody might be playing ahead of them if it's based on form. But it's very difficult to explain to a group and it, it doesn't help and it, it kind of breeds a little bit of rancor if players are being overlooked who are playing well. Then it's very difficult to kind of turn around to the group and go, well, we're still picking him because in 1872, you know, he was brilliant. For me, they are still, I don't need to have the personnel to pick on form. I think Hawkshaw and say Gal Ford are the other two alternatives there. I think they are centres that can play 10. Now, there's a difference between playing 10 when you were in school, boys, and stuff like that. They both, I haven't seen enough of Hawkshaw in 10 in the professional game to say I would, I think he's a, vi- a viable alternative to um, to Jack Carthy. If he is good enough, you've got to give him time, with it, but then you've got to drop him. You've got to drop Jack Carthy. Um, and that's uh, the equivalent to Graham Raintree dropping Conor Murray. So, um it is not yeah, a brave, brave. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's, it's about brave decisions. I do think Hawkshaw can play 10. I do think he has the character and the skill set to play there. And I do think, yeah, there comes a time where you have to go, you know what? I'm going to give this guy three or four games to show me that he can do it or he can't. And in those circumstances, you hope that, uh, and this is where luck plays a part in it as well. You're looking at those matches, how the team fares, how other players play around them. All of those things are factors into whether, I mean, it's just not, you can't look at a 10 in isolation. So Hawkshaw's yeah. going to get the summer, Carl Ford are going to get the summer training, playing. Yeah. With guys. Carty will probably be in and out of the Irish camp. So they are going to get that. And it's his first season there. He's going to get a proper preseason in there to call a new coach. This kind of uh, clears the, not the new coach, but he's the head coach now, comes in, mm-hmm. clears, the, clears the doors a little bit. Um, and it, like that's his opportunity to prove it and to go, he'll have to show him something in that in the preseason to go, I'm worth giving me four games. And if he doesn't do that, then we know Carty is still starting and no one displaces him. Then we'll know they didn't do enough in the off season to at least raise a question. Yeah, I think also just, I'm sorry, I was going to say more, Justin, this is like, if you go, the fact that there's a new-ish coaching team there in terms of the yeah. co- other coaches that they brought in, I think then all the players now have to prove themselves to a new group if you like, coaching group. So that's a positive as well. In some respects, you're looking at, people are looking at the the, the playing group uh, through, there's a freshness there, if you like, in the coaching team. And players respond to that as well. They know that if they can prove during the summer, you know, training, stuff like that, in prepping for the new season, that they have an opportunity to impress a new set of coaches. If you had the existing group there, maybe it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't quite be the same. I have a huge amount of time for Carl Ford as well. I think he's a super young player. But I agree with I think he's at 12. Yeah. And I suppose overall, like you were saying, that they, they have this freshness going into next season. And overall, Connacht, although they won't be happy to get these pats on the back for a gutsy performance last weekend, they finished the season on a positive note. Like they're, they have this new coaching ticket in place for the past few months. So 
you know, they have that continuity because Andy Friend announced his retirement a few months ago, or not retirement, but that he was stepping away from Connacht. And, um, you know, they're after finishing, I think this is Connacht's second best position that they have ever finished, second best season. So, you know, there is a lot of positivity. They have that Heineken Cup qualification for next season as well. And they have made a few key signings. So, I suppose there's a good buzz around the province at the moment. Yeah, I think it's I think it's uh I think it is positive for for Connacht. I liked the fact that, you know, they didn't go to uh they didn't go down to the Stormers and look for a pat in the head and just be plucky and gutsy. They went to play. Yes, it unraveled, but it unraveled not so much because they took a step back. They just just didn't play well and and within the context of what they tried to do, it kind of fell apart a bit. Though I thought there was a subtle well, sorry not so much subtle, there was a difference there to kind of being cowed a little bit physically and mentally about the challenge that they faced. I didn't I didn't think they were at all. In fact, I thought they went there to play. So I, I agree with you. I think that it's been a positive, very positive finish to the season. On, an, on the Andy Friend note, I, I think that I don't know him, but everything I've seen, he comes across as a class individual, uh, a very good person, uh, a very good coach somebody who did a lot to put uh, a shape an attacking shape and a shape on and establish a culture in Connacht. And I think uh, he's left a legacy and a positive legacy at that. And it's really up to Connacht to, to kind of build on some of the things that he put in place, some of the people that he put in place, his attitudes. And you would hope that Connacht would continue to build on that and to, to, I suppose, to have the courage to play. I, you would hate to think that, that, they would change tack now. So as Gordon touched on it there as well, and you touched on it, um, they've made some very good signings and potentially they have a, they they could have quite an exciting back line. So yeah. you'd like to see them play some ball, some expansive rugby next year and see where it takes them. Yeah, everyone is sorry to see Andy Friend move on. He really has created something special in Connacht and and they've developed so many young players, homegrown players, and he handed debuts to 54 players um, since he came in and made the key signings, the likes of Mac Hansen. You know, we saw what a revelation he was. And the, st- the style of rugby um, has been a joy to watch. And he, he himself, you know, I've, I've met him a few times and he's... He really loved his time here in Galway. Of course, everyone would love their time in Galway as a Galway girl. You know, I'm not surprised. Was what I'd say. A great bunch here in the West. But he embraced life in Connacht. And when you think about it, when he came in in 2018, Connacht were really at a low ebb. And um, after the Kieran Keane era, like it, it, he really had to rebuild the club and their identity. And after five years, he really has brought Connacht, as I touched on earlier, to finish the second best they've ever finished in um, in the league. So he he has a lasting legacy here and you would hope um, that the coaching staff that are in there would be able to build on that now, Gordon. Yeah, it's like uh, Matt O'Connor took the uh, took the bullet for uh, for Leo taking the taking the coaching role post Joe Schmidt. Um, Keane took the uh, took the bullet for uh, for Andy Friend post uh, the Pat Lam era. Yeah, you know when you when you come into those big, you know those big, uh, big expectations with a club after a really successful coach, it is almost almost impossible to be successful directly after that. Um, I think it takes a special coach to be able to actually to to do that. Um, so Andy Friend's come in and. As you said, it was a systematic rebuilding of Connacht. And it's funny, I think one of the things the uh, next coaches will have to think about in Connacht is almost taking a leaf out of the Ulster book. You can have a philosophy and you can have a game plan and approach to doing it, but you also need the skill set in behind. And Munster have clearly worked really, really hard at their skills. Um, Really good point, yeah. And I think... It's not to say that I think Connacht have been so busy trying to win the games in front of them that they probably haven't been able to focus on everything that they would have liked to. So, you know, when Pat Lamb was at the at their best, their skill set was absolutely oh, their skill set was exceptionally high. And you could say they've probably been guilty of some mistakes uh in the 
yeah, just some execution mistakes that they could easily remedy. Andy Friend here has been hugely successful. It's left Connacht in a great place. They've got players in the national team. Their second highest fin in the, uh, finish in there. There's an indelible mark left in the Connacht history with Andy Friend there as a coach, as a person. Players will talk about him um, positively in the year as the, as the as the as the years go on. No doubt, and seasons go by. Absolutely. And before we focus in on um, Leinster La Rochelle, we'll just finish on our chat about Munster and uh, what they face next week when they travel to Cape Town to take on the Stormers. We all saw the Stormers celebrating on the final whistle. Um, I'd say that cameraman has been um, removed <laughs> um, ever since. But Munster beat the Stormers in Cape Town last month. Um, They've got players coming back in. You touched on it, Gordon. They have two weeks of a lead in. They are the underdogs, which Munster love. What chance would you give them? That's a really good question. I think the South Africans, like the Stormers, the South African mindset is going to kick back in now. And I think they will, one, just want to win because they lost to them recently. And they will look at that go, well, you didn't win. We lost it. That, that type of... Uh, that's the type of main mindset that South African teams tend to have. And they love knockout rugby. They absolutely love it. That's what it's 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 in their DNA. They will be going for this. But that is not, that doesn't factor into what, what Munster can do in all this. So Munster need to go up and they've said it, Rantry said it, Peter Manny said it, it all from nothing, but they need to be better in every match they play. Can they be better? Absolutely. This will be Jack Crowley's most important game on a huge number of reasons. Um, his World Cup, the potential World Cup involvement from an Irish context, but is also his opportunity to steer Munster to a to a to a trophy. Um, and this is what the drop kick. This is that by ten. To, this is he has to do that moment. He has to do that forty that four minutes. He has to do that for ten times twice <laughs> so he has got to be he has got to steer Munster for the AP and can he yes absolutely can Munster do it absolutely they can John what do you think I'm doubling down now on this I'm going Munster yeah definitely they can do it I think they will do it I don't think they can do it I think they will do it um, I'll see I yeah no, I, I I take everything that Gordon's saying there about, about the Stormers and they've been very good champions and they're a very good side and if you give them scope yeah, they'll they'll um as they showed against Connacht when they scored some of the tries, they've got some outstanding individual players who can play. Um, they've got a, a couple of ways of playing. They've got a lot of power, physical edge. But I don't think there's just something about Munster, their momentum, all they've achieved, the players coming back, the two week break, all they've accomplished on the road, the quality of the rugby. The, the performance graph going up all the time in, in particularly in the last two months of the season and a little bit longer, I suppose, in some respects than that as well. I just think they have all of those things to me point to a team that is beginning to realize how good it can be. And is that very much when I say on the way back, they're, they're heading down a road to being a much better team than they were uh, you know, at the start of the season. And I think, or the end, sorry, probably it's fair to say at the end of last season, I think what Graham Rountree and the coaching team have done is very impressive. I think there has been a progression, particularly laterally, a very good progression. I think that the rugby that they're playing is very enjoyable to watch, but there's an end product to it as well. It's not just, it's not just throw their ball around and hope for the best. There's a structure to it. There's an encouragement. You can see that, like I say, within individuals, the skill sets have developed and some players are playing outstanding rugby, all of which leads me uh, to believe that I think that they can go to South Africa and I think they can win. I think they will win. Um, John, you're just trying to win back some uh, Munster supporters after writing your article. I, I, didn't mention, I didn't mention the word shot clock once in this. Uh, and I also didn't mention... Much elaborate on this, John. You didn't, yeah, no, didn't, didn't mention the fact that it was totally clear out in the last few minutes. Uh, no, no, those things we, we keep 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 them off to off to off to one side. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, it's okay. I love, I loved all the love I got from Munster supporters la- uh, over the Monday piece. Yeah, shot clock mentioned it. Um, yeah, tongue in cheek reference to it, but obviously, um, it went down like a lead balloon. So I, I'm not expecting to curry favor with Munster supporters but anymore. Listen, I think, but that is, but what's brilliant as much as it pain as as it is equally as painful for me to watch that that win because the celebrations in the Aviva. But what's really what's really good to see is Munster supporters coming back, and it's giving them they're getting back in, going. Oh, actually, this isn't just a one-off performance now. This is a series of performance, and that's what we probably built guilty. They were guilty of under Van Gran of saying, going, oh, you know, a win is like, oh, is this? Oh, no, it's not. One step forward, three steps back. So this has been consistent improvement all the way through. I just I wouldn't underestimate how big a challenge it is traveling to South Africa Stormers full stadium you know and they're they are they're they are going for this um and I think yeah it's it, it I think it might be a it might be a step too far for them this season um I'd be delighted if they did win um always wanted to say no, you've got to say that with more conviction yeah but I was like you want to see you want to see an Irish team uh, yeah. uh win um, so maybe we could explain that to some of the Munster supporters who are uh, oh, bought Rochelle jerseys this week. I, I, I'm in no position to le- lecture any Munster supporters. I'm, I'm in no position to talk to Munster supporters anymore, <laughs> obviously based on my last week. Well, we do have two Irish teams in two finals and the first one is coming up this weekend. Um, La Rochelle are in town. Ron O'Gara is back again. Um, and the teams have been announced. So we'll, I suppose, start our chat um, focusing on the game but by looking at the teams and as expected there were what 12 key players sitting in the stands last weekend they've all come back in and um, we've got um, Keenan back in Jimmy O'Brien James Lowe I suppose is the one and he was out injured and um, no surprises there with the team selection perhaps maybe Jenkins is on the bench with Maloney and Ryan um, anything stand out for you Gordon? This is so, John, and we we were talking about this yeah. in May. So, there is going to be a huge hindsight dissection on this team. So, we you've taken the biggest biggest issue for me, on this is and I wrote about this in on uh, Wednesday. We're accommodating Jack Conan at eight by moving the best number eight in arguably in world rugby at the moment to six where he is less effective. And I think that is a massive, he's less involved in the game and he has a massive issue for Leinster because for me, this game is going to be decided on possession and the use of that possession by those teams. And Jack Conan has been, he's been back into form. He's done brilliant, but still I don't believe Jack Conan is as good a number eight as Caelan Doris is. And I think that is a big issue. Ross Maloney, Starting uh, without Jay- when Jason Jenkins is not in, Jason Jenkins was signed for these type of games. You know, he's you know, he brings a physicality to it. And yes, you can talk that he becomes on with 20 minutes to go and he'll be the difference with 20 minutes to go. If that's the case, absolutely fantastic. It just seems less likely that he's needed in the last 20 minutes as opposed to the first 60. John, would you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I was talking to Gordon about this earlier on the week, and I, I, I would echo his thoughts there. I think that Kellen Doris and Artie Sive are probably the best two eights in the world. I think that you take, I don't know what it is, and you might say, well, you know, the number on your back shouldn't matter, and okay, you're playing a slightly different position, but you can still do things around the pitch that you normally do, but it just hasn't panned out that way with Kellen Doris. I agree with everything that, that Gordon said about... Jack Conan, I think he's played really, really well. But for me, you pick your best players in their best position. I would have gone with Jason Jenkins because the reason that... So there's only one change to the pack from last year's final. And that's, I think, Dan Sheehan's in for Ronan Kelleher. So uh, I, I would have picked Jason Jenkins. I think you need that power initially in the game. I don't think he's a player that you bring on to chase the game. Or to see out the game, I think Ross Maloney would have more qualities in that respect in terms of if you need to, 
I know he calls the line out, and this again isn't a reflection on his ability or his form for that matter in some respects, but it's just horses for courses. Sometimes you just pick, to use a sporting cliche, you just put, pick players for certain games. I think there's a, a different dynamic. What we're saying here about Kellen Doris is that we think he's one of the best number eights in the world. What we think with Jason Jenkins is that he provides something that Leinster don't have in any other player, which is sheer size and power. And in terms of if you want quick rock ball and you've only got one player clearing, like Jason Jenkins is a fair amount of clearing out on his own, basically, in rocks. And you you don't have to commit as many numbers to it either. And, and he has that dynamic and he's a very powerful carrier as well. Jenkins, so for me... There is the... It's the... You look back to last year's final and you're going, if... Jason Jenkins had been there for the last 20 minutes, they would have won that game. Yeah. I think that's, you know, they're probably looking at that going, well, we can stay with them. I think personally, I, I would have liked to have seen Jenkins in the second row, Ryan Baird at six and Kellen Doris at eight, Jack Cohn and Ross Maloney on the bench. And I think you're, you're going after the game from the opening whistle. Um, the Leo will explain today is probably explaining as we speak at the press, pre-match press conference, you know, what they're, the thinking behind it and why he's gone with the players that he has. In terms of, if you look at it, and Gordon touched on it there, Dylan Lades was man of the match last year in last year's final. Um, so that that matchup out wide, uh, and we'll talk about this, uh, La Rochelle have a great kicking game. They've got a bet. They've got uh, Tawara Kier Barlow is back, who missed last year's final. He is every bit as influential as Jemison Gibson Park is for Leinster. Uh, the former he's a former old black he's a brilliant player he's a, he's a senior figure for the team he uh his work rate and defense his covering his the way he reads the game the way he uh orchestrates the attack uh is hugely impressive and he takes a lot of pressure off their 25 year old out half who is also who didn't play obviously in last year's final because they had Ihea West last year and this uh younger if you like in his mid 20s Anthony Hastoy is a really, really good footballer and La Rochelle have an excellent kicking game. They're kicking the variety to their kicking game is a real challenge to Leinster. How Leinster cope with that. Uh, and obviously, then you've got, you know, when you look at La Rochelle as well, you've got Jonathan Dante, who's one of the best centers in world rugby, one of the best inside centers in world rugby, hugely powerful. And the uh, Samoan Satini is outside him. Again, very, very powerful. You've got the two South African wingers who are both very quick, good footballers. Lades, obviously, um, was man of the match last year. And then you've Bruce Dulan, who's another senior figure, a French international uh, fullback. They have a lot of um, they have a lot of pace. They have a lot of creativity. They have um, the uh, they have power in the center. They can play it several. A bit like their bit like their general patterns. They can play it whichever way they want. Use a power game. Use their kicking game. If you kick loosely, you're going to be in trouble. If you fall off tackles, you're going to be in trouble, both up front and, and certainly in the centre as well. So, yeah, I think they've gone for, well, it's it's a kind of indication. Alton Delan is on the bench. They've gone for a 6-2 split on the bench. So they've rolled the dice, which I'm surprised. This is the second French team to arrive in the Aviva Stadium. We've gone, you know, we must do. We must go 6-2 on the bench. We know how that worked out the last time for Toulouse when they lost but that doesn't, it does, but for some reason, that doesn't seem as big a worry for La Rochelle. Like they, it, it seems that they would be able to cope a little bit better if they did lose. You know, well, the other thing is they also had the safety of uh, Batia in. Correct, exactly. Yeah, that's 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 the reason that they've gone for six two because they can they can move Levani Batia from uh, six out into the center if necessary, so he covers the back line as well. They've got a scrum half um, on the bench, uh, scrum half, and uh, Jules Favre, the centre slash winger, uh, is also uh, on the bench. So yeah, you're right, absolutely. They do. They're not as they're not taking as much of a risk as Toulouse, but it's interesting. Alton Delans on the bench. The bench they've gone with Botia. Uh, so yeah, you can see where they feel that they'll had they they will target Leinster if you like. You spent a bit of time out in La Rochelle with uh, Ron O'Gara for your piece this weekend, John. Um, any insights? You mentioned the kicking game there into how they're going to approach the game from what you saw um, when you attended their training. Yeah, I was. Uh, I got to spend three days with him. And he was a very generous host. Um, it was good to catch up again and, and reconnect. And yeah, I went in and watched them train on, on the Thursday. So this was the Thursday of last week. And they were preparing for the Montpellier game in the French top 14. So 
They had uh, the yellow bibs were were preparing for Montpellier and the black bibs were were preparing for Leinster and they were playing against each other in training. What struck me just in in some aspects of their training was was uh, how much kicking, how much practice kicking they did when they were running backline on backline, um, looking for space with big long wide passes initially and then, but also the the amount of. Uh, kicking they were doing in training in those circumstances, looking for space and, and who was doing it. So it wasn't just Anton Hastoy, it was Jonathan Dunty who pushed a couple of kicks, cross kicks in as well. So um, they seem to, uh, well, not they seem to, they they do a lot of that and have done a lot of that in the French top 14 this year. So if you drop your players back, they try and get you, they get the ball quickly to the edge and try and take you there. And if you bring your, if you bring your wingers up, then they look for the space in behind. So they're clever. They manage the game that way because they've got power in the center as well. They know they can just dump off ball to uh, to the likes of Dante and Satini as well. Uh, and they can um, they can carry it up for you. So there's a bit of an all court game to the way that they play, uh, to use a basketball term. And so yeah, it was just interesting watching them train. Sorry, I was just going to say there was it was this sounds very Irish. It was relaxed, but intense. It was, there was uh, a little bit of laughing and joking and there was a bit of fun, but, but when they were, when they were doing things, there was an intensity and focus to it. But then 30 seconds later, they'd be squirting water at each other. And they just seemed confident. They seemed very confident as a group. That was the one thing that struck me watching two, a two hour training session was, um, they, they focused when they needed to, and they were nice and relaxed and chilled. Yeah, Gordon, you want to come in there? Yeah, just like the, the the kicking thing, I find is really uh, really interesting because the general in say the URC and even to a certain extent in the Champions Cup has been you're either kicking from ten or you're kicking from nine, but you're kicking to compete. Whereas and that traditional of up in the air and going up and and trying to kick from looking at La Rochelle, I just had before we came on, I had a quick look at their la, at their last thing and their last couple of games, and the way the 5022 has moved them in the backfield um they are really focusing on the kind of zones that have become available off the back of that so if teams don't play a sweeper the nine in behind they're quite happy like you'll see uh, plenty of time players showing up on the 10 or the first receiver's shoulder and just dinking it over the top it's just into space and they're happy to go into it and it's the bounce of a ball then, but they're quite happy to do that repeatedly, repeatedly because it changes then the defensive line and then what they're doing is shifting it to the 13-15 channel and depending on what the defences do then, if the winger comes up, the, the there is there can be a little bit space in, in, uh, in that square just behind the open side wing. And then they're just basically dropping it in there and they're backing. They've got two rapidly quick wingers and there's a foot race between them and the cover of the 15. Um, so th- that's very different to what a lot of teams do. And even if you look at that compared to, to what Leinster do, Leinster traditionally kick when they're uh, they're kicking to regather. And that comes an awful lot off James Gibson Park and with Ross Maloney. Now, they're arguably better... Sorry, Ross Maloney off uh, Ross Byrne. They're arguably better... Com- competing with uh, Ross Burns' kicks because Henshaw and Ringrose are pretty good. I don't think Leinster are a strong kit when they're kicking from nine because I don't think Jimmy O'Brien and James Lowe are as good attacking the opposition's uh, wingers. I suppose it comes with the benefit of having um, a kicker like Ron Nogara as your head coach. Yeah, certainly. Uh, he didn't slot into uh, training at any point. He was there with his iPad. It was probably, uh, there's no way he was risking the iPad. But uh, yeah, no, he he kind of, um, there's no doubt that if you, there was an interview with Anton Hastoy in, in uh, Media Olympique during the week, and uh, you could see that he paid tribute to O'Gara and what he's learned. The reason that he left Poe, he was coveted by half a dozen top 14 clubs, and he decided to go to La Rochelle. And one of the, one of the factors was working with Ron O'Gara. Um, so I think definitely that he helps Hastoy to see the space. It's like he's 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 it's it would be true of the whole back line and the way he wants them to play, but that aspect that, that Gordon's touched on there, that kicking in the variety in that kicking game, you can see it in all the matches that they play, and that's what they look for. That's you know, it's encouraged as well as playing. They can also, don't get me wrong, they can also play. 
They've a, a decent offloading game. They've got plenty of power, like I said, in the center. Satini has very good footwork as well. The outside center. Dylan Lades, who plays on one wing, is a full back by inclination more than anything else. So as well as being very, very quick and a, and, uh, a very good footballer. So they have that. Uh, they have the ability to attack you in lots of ways. And if Leinster aren't vigilant, if they... If they, like Leinster, can't afford to just rush headlong, you know, have aggressive line speed and leave space in behind because as Gordon touched on there, that that those little dinks over the top yeah. um, will cost them. And if your nine isn't sweeping, it, it isn't effective at sweeping and all that sort of stuff. So you, Leinster have to be, have to think about how they're going to counter this game and, and where where they can close down the amount of space as well when La Rochelle, and that will all be predicated on what sort of ball that La Rochelle get. But the one thing that they have is they have the sheer size that they have in players like Weenie, Antonio, Will Skelton. You can give them the ball on a standing start and they will still occupy more than one tackler and they will still get to the gain line and they will still cause problems. Levani Bottia as well is another huge carrier for them. So... Just, on um, the, uh, just one of the things while you were talking there with Raj. So I remember he challenged me when I made the move from cent- from wing into centre and he just went, you know, after the first couple of uh, months, he was there like, listen, right, you've, you've had the, you've had the, you've had the time. Now defence will get better. You need to be thinking two, three phases ahead. You can't just be reactive now. And that's the kind of benefit of having someone like him as your head coach. So young 10 coming in and going, okay, you 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 have to be sitting above this game and you have to be thinking strategically because Kerr Barlow's doing it, but you need to be doing it as well. So he so Gara's not telling Kerr Barlow how to how to play the game, how to think about the game, but he's got this young 10 that he's able to shape and mold and go, well, actually, this is how you could think about the game and challenging him like that. That is really, you know, that's that's the added bonus of having someone like um having someone like O'Gara there. That you're kind of he's challenging him to think about the game differently and how he might approach it, um, and that's an incredible resource for a young ten to have. Um, yeah, his fingerprints are all over this team. Yeah, disappointingly, yes. Um, but you're kind of. Yeah, but you, but you mentioned the physicality there, uh, John, and I suppose it's been one of the main points of difference. Um, for La Rochelle over the past few years, like they beat them in the semi final in 2021, the final last year, they're focused on this three in a row against Leo Cullen's side. So, Leinster, I'm sure, have studied all these recent defeats in detail. So, what can they change? That is a very good question because I, I would have. I would have looked at the team that they've selected for tomorrow's game and I would have said that. I thought that they might make changes rather than going with, like I said, seven and the eight that played in last year's final. Um, I I think that they've got to look at at. Um, I put it to 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 Raj during the week. I, I said to him that Leinster will want to play the game at a higher tempo, and he said, "No, no, no, we'll want to play the game at a high tempo as well." That's what we've done in the the French top fourteen. For Leinster to Leinster have that's my biggest a. that's my biggest worry is because yeah. La Rochelle are really comfortable with a lot of possession. Yes, I I think if I look at it and say Leinster have Plan A and La Rochelle have Plan A and B and potentially C in terms of the way they play, Leinster need quick ball because they don't have La Rochelle's easy power game if you like when things get a little bit sticky they can just give it to a number of individuals who'll carry over the game line and can kick start or restart that game La Rochelle probably have a more nuanced kicking game I think in terms of what they've shown in the top 14 um so Leinster Leinster need to use possession well they need to make sure that they're uh that they're very good in terms of their clearing out their ball retention um putting kind of pace on the game yes but not getting isolated they can't afford to turn over too many balls they can't afford to give La Rochelle access to their 22 and therefore a platform with a line at mall which they're very powerful so all of these things are that 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 Leinster have to be um very accurate and precise in what they try to do and they can't give cheap turnovers and they can't be ill-disciplined and they have to play the referee Jacko Piper well they've got to be intelligent at the breakdown 
they've got to understand that whatever picture they're creating in the scrums has to be something that appeals to Piper and, the, and, and also because of these days, the assistant referees. So these are all areas where you would look at and you would say that Leinster need an awful lot to go right for them on the day. They need to play close to their best and they need to play. And now they're, they're absolutely capable of this. They're absolutely capable of winning, but it will require a performance that, that will be as good as anything they've produced this season. I suppose La Rochelle and Ron O'Gara's focus is stopping Leinster at source and stopping them from getting any bit of a foothold in a game. So how do Leinster counteract that? How will they have to play differently to make sure that that they do get that clean ball and that they do, um, I suppose, that they are on the front foot and that they will they have to kick more as a result or use their footwork more? Or how do you see them counteract this, John? I think that they, Leinster will need to be a little bit more subtle and clever in how they and who they run off Ross Byrne in that channel inside and outside of him. I would expect them to do a little bit more with their blindside wings. I think that it doesn't work as well when he's doing the wraparound play. I think Lara Shaw will understand that if they push through that initial line and get to him, they can shut it off. They'll get him in the backfield and Leinster will be in big, big trouble if he's caught in, in that position. So I think Leinster will have to kind of run a few, what would they call American football trap plays, where they shape as if they're going out the back and they look for other carry uh, other carriers. Um, Raj spoke to me last week about how much he rates uh, Andrew Goodman, uh, Goody as he calls him, the Leinster backs coach who he worked with at the Crusaders. He expects him to come up with a couple of plays that he won't have seen before. So I think that's really important for Leinster. I also think that um, footwork is so important in contact against a bigger team. So the Kalen Doris does it brilliantly. Dan Sheehan does it brilliantly when he goes into contact. James Ryan does it uh, well as well. At times, they need to bring that with them. They need to use their feet when they're uh, on the gain line to get through. And once they get through, then they've got to look at um, giving Jemis. I think for Leinster, sorry, to, to answer your question, for Leinster to try from a creative perspective, they've got to give Jemison Gibson Park the platform to make the great decisions that he makes and to run the game. If they can give Jemison Gibson Park the opportunity to run run Leinster's game, then I think Leinster will be in a very in a very good position. His choices are, are first class and his ability to bring in players and to vary the point of attack. I think they have to be a little bit careful in terms of getting players isolated, which they do from time to time. So it's not, they've got to temper the excitement levels of making that initial breach and one person on his own. And then you realize that La Rochelle, they have their hooker, Pierre Bougarit, uh, Batia, Skelton, there's, there's a good few. Aldrich's very, very good over the ball. And obviously the two centers are good, uh, Dante and Satini as well. So they Leinster ha have to be very precise at the breakdown, make sure that they clean out uh, well and not commit too many numbers, get that sort of momentum and then allow Gibson Park uh, to, to run the game for them. I think if they can do all those things and with a little bit of footwork and pace on the game, then I think that they'll be in a good place. But as you mentioned earlier, Kerr Barlow is back for La Rochelle, who missed the final last year. And if we look at La Rochelle, like, and Ron Nagar said it as well, people should change the narrative to stopping La Rochelle because they are the champions. And yeah. Raj has brought a love and a hunger for this competition to this club. And they are a better team than they were last year. They're evolving every year and they have no fear of coming to Dublin, Gordon. Yeah, you got to remember, like, there's a huge psychological battle going on here. And there's a, a little bit of writing about this and a little bit of, uh, talk about it that you know how much scar tissue is in the Leinster psyche about this uh, I get about this La Rochelle team because like, I played most of my career losing to Munster um, and one of the chief architects of that Munster greatness is the head coach there um, I was really interested in that interview with Raymond Rule and he was talking about when he was on that interview with uh, John O'Gibbs another guy who came from uh, a really strong cultural background um, and they were interviewing him less about his, you know, what he thought about rugby. They're just trying to find out, is this guy a good fella or not? Because they want good people in the changing rooms. Um, and you can do an awful lot with that. You've got good players who are good people. Um, 
that'll play for each other. That goes an awful long way. And you put that down with an awful lot of um, good coaching and um, good structures and uh, good budgeting behind it. And you've got a very, very dangerous recipe for success. For success. Um, and we're seeing that now. And I think that's, you know, a coach not afraid to flip things on its head and go, well, why is it about us stopping Leinster? You know, mm-hmm. they should. And I think that's, so this is, and again, so this is the, we're going to, we're, we'll pick this apart quite ruthlessly afterwards. So what, who does it better? La Rochelle are going to contra- concentrate on themselves and they will do. They know they can win possession. They know they're going to be good with possession. So they're going to concentrate on that. What do Leinster have to do? Leinster have to be unbelievably brilliant with their possession, but they also have to stop La Rochelle. Because if both teams play possession and go full out, full bore, um, it won't. It, it it won't. It's unlikely to finish in uh, Leinster's favour. Um, Leinster have to frustrate, dis, uh, disrupt, um, La Rochelle, and that can be mentally. It can be physically. It can be through with the ball. So do Leinster start fast, and can they get a 10, 15 point, um, pressure? Can they get that scoreboard pressure, which creates a unique so that's that puts pressure on La Rochelle who maybe aren't used to being behind in clutch games and that's a way Leinster can find to to to, to win to win the game um so there's there's loads of little uh ba- battles in this but one of the key things for me for Leinster is their defensive performance how they have as John's talked about their attack shape needs to be a little bit better different um Gibson Park needs to lead the attack rather than Ross Byrne replicating Johnny Sexton wraparounds out the back because they just don't work as well for them. Um, I think defensively, Leinster have to throw something different at La Rochelle. Now, whether that's the blind side, um, you know, pillar, tackling Kerr Barlow every time he passes the ball, whether it is... Josh van der Fleer going in a bit like Sam Warburton in behind the tackler for the, the way the Welsh used to do it. They need to do something a little bit different in the defence to upset or to rattle a few La Rochelle cages because if they don't, it is bigger men running into it's just bigger bigger men running into run, running into Leinster players. And as John said. The one thing they can go to is they can give it to Will Skelton. And while Uno Antonio may not be fit and he might be blown through his through his hole at 35 minutes, Will Skelton is uh, he's he is he is now as close to an 80 minute man as he's ever going to be. There's a couple of things, sorry, just I'd add to that. One is that that Raj has said that he feels that his team has a stronger 23. He feels that their their bench is capable of maintaining the level uh, that the starting team sets throughout a game. I think if you look at the semi-final, uh, La Rochelle to, in 2021, La Rochelle won far easier than the final scoreline suggested. Last year, La Rochelle scored three tries and Leinster scored none. They kick, I think they kicked six penalties. So there, it, it goes back to the point that Raj made about how do Leinster stop us? Because La Rochelle have scored tries quite easily against Leinster. And maybe it comes down to that. Maybe that is the key point for tomorrow is how do Leinster stop La Rochelle from scoring tries? Because that's been a week, that's that's been, if you like, a fundamental or a basis for La Rochelle's victories in the two matches in which they've beaten Leinster so far. And I'm I'm shaking my head here. Like to, I just pick I just had a quick look at the bookmakers and William Hill have Leinster as nine point favourites, and Paddy Power of Leinster as seven point favourites. And I'm really struggling to see how and why that that is the case. So and how, how many points does the home advantage give them? I suppose that's the one of the well, key differences. That's a really good question, Marjais, because La Rochelle's record on the road is almost better than their home record in the top fourteen. I think, it, or it might be the it might be the same. I think they lost the loss against uh, Montpellier. I think puts them, you know, maybe a better, slightly better record at home, but they. The reason why they're doing so well is they win on the road. Yeah. It's absolutely bizarre and unheard of in the top 14. The other thing they say is, and this is where it's something that, that Raj deserves huge credit for the way he sets up his team, the way they're coached, the way they play, all that sort of stuff. But 
at the very essence of what he looks for when he's recruiting players is he looks for good people, people that fit into the culture that they've established at the club. And that is something that's very strong. Like he calls them a band of brothers. He told me a story for the piece that's in tomorrow's Irish Times about the fact that when he went in, he uh, sat the players down. John O'Gibbs, I think, was still in charge at the time. But he asked them, are we teammates or are we brothers? And there was a reserve prop sitting in the room and he said, we are teammates. And he said, well, until we're brothers, until we understand the concept and the values of being brothers here out in the pitch, we're not going to win. So that's something he's championed, that culture, the way he dis- deconstructed in the in before his time, coaches used to eat separately from the players, different tables, all that sort of stuff. He's integrated. He's, he's placed a huge emphasis on that aspect of it, creating that culture, that friend, that brotherhood. And you see that in their performances. They play for one another. And he said, you can have all the statistical data, all the data you like in the world, but there's no data for getting off the ground, getting back in the line and playing for your teammate. And that's why Munster were so bloody successful in the early 2000s. And that's why Leinster have been so successful for the last, since 2008, 2009. That's why Leinster have been so successful because they embody an awful lot of that. But what's clear is, and it's, it's bizarre to even say this about a French team, is that that is now a standard in that French team. So that has now the massive advantage that Leinster used to have over every other team has now been leveled as a playing field. And you're kind of going, okay, well, culturally, they're on a par. So now it comes down to individuals and it comes down to the team. So that outperformance advantage that Leinster had may not be there. Yeah, I think also you have six, sorry, I was going to say more. Just there's like there's, I think there's six non French players. So I'm just trying to think off the top of my head uh, here. Uh, if you count uh, Antonio as French uh, naturalized, I think you've got. Skelton, um, Botia. you've got Botia, you've got uh, Kier Barlow, you've got Satini, you've got the two wings, Lades and Raymond Rule. So those players add, they bring, uh, they add to the mix of the culture within the group, the local group. So, and they fit it in and they fit it in as people as much as players. So it is a very, very tight group. And I take Gordon's points, the same with Leinster, very, very tight. So, but it's unusually for a French team, uh, having that resilience on the road, that ability to win on the road, and that is the value that those players that we've just mentioned add to the group as well as, uh, you know, and that bond that the team has. So I think that is something that unusually that we're talking about. We used to only we used to talk about it, you know, to lose a little bit, uh, to lose, sorry, and then Clermont in their pomp would, would bring a kind of challenge when they played away from home, but. And then other French teams wouldn't. They wouldn't kind of turn up in the same way. But it's I think you could talk about La Rochelle. And yeah, I got Raj has worked on changing their mindset, the French mindset of playing away from home. And they, they travel here with no pressure. Like the pressure is on Leinster and um, playing at home, even though La Rochelle are the defending champions. Um, everything is riding on this for Leinster. And La Rochelle have been their Achilles heel for the past few years. So how much... Will the defeats against La Rochelle linger? Um, will they fuel their performance? Um, or will it manifest as pressure, especially at home? I don't think. I think if Leinster play the same way, if Leinster don't bring something new and different to the table, I think they're, they're, they'll suffer the same fate that they've suffered. If you look at it, two Irishmen have masterminded four European victories over Leinster. So Mark McCall with Saracens, Ron Nogara with La Rochelle. They understand Leinster. They understand the, the, the background, the team, the players and stuff like that. So Leinster have to bring something different to the way that they play uh, against La Rochelle, I think, for them to be successful. I think the home advantage is distilled a little bit by the fact that a lot of tickets were pre-sold, as if you ask any uh, Leinster supporters in between their tiers when they're talking about the fact that they could only get access to 2,800 tickets. So those that didn't pre-buy, you know, so it won't be a, it won't be the normal, if you like, Leinster crowd in terms of advantage in that respect. You wouldn't imagine anyway, 
in a 51 and a half thousand capacity so there'll be more neutrals if you like in the stadium and uh that'll be so it won't be quite the same intensity that would be in terms of Leinster's home support so I think I think to say that it's it's a home game it certainly is it's in the city um there will be more Leinster supporters there but Leinster and, and again Raj touched on this he feels that the uh, home advantage won't have a material difference. He said it's a rugby pitch with a referee. It won't be any different. That's the way they look at it. That's what he has said to his players. Uh, come on. That's, As a that's, player what, going that's what he's trying to get his players to believe. Yeah, no, no. And there you could get it. You get why he's doing it. There is pressure on La, La Rochelle. There is expectation on them. They have invested a lot financially. Resor- they put an awful lot into this team. There is an expectation that they come home with that trophy. That is pressure. Who the challenge for Leinster is they need to expose that pressure on them and make it count. They absolutely have to do that. How they do it, fast start. As I said, John's everything is the same. They've got to show something different. They have got to be, and we said, take them from Munster. They have got to play for 80 minutes. They played for 74 minutes in the final last year. And then ultimately the power game gave away from them. Leinster need to be absolutely almost perfect in this in this match, but they can absolutely do it. Leadership is going to be huge for them. How Leo, Goody, uh, Sean O'Brien set them up, James Ryan, Tyke Furlong. They need the roll of the dice as well. They need a little bit of luck to go their way, how they manage their thing. I think Leinster can absolutely do this. There's so rarely an underdog coming into games. Bookies might have them in there. Leinster will be sharper, sharper, uh, will be sharp, will, will have had to be sharper in the two week build up to this. So they have to make that count, and I believe they can. Okay, prediction time. So, John, for you, will Leinster add a fifth star to their jersey, or will O'Gara disrupt the party again? Uh, yeah, I think it's funny, and I was talking to Gordon about this. My, my slight concern when, when in the build up to the match was, uh, was this preoccupation with a fifth star. I mean, obviously you focus on the performance and, and the result will take care of itself. And I think for Leinster, you can't add that that desperation to get that fifth star. The fifth star means nothing. It can't be a distraction. It's literally, how do we beat La Rochelle over 80 minutes uh, playing at, you know, in a uh, in Dublin? And that's what they've got to focus on. The byproduct of winning is, is the fifth star. Um, but I think that they've enough to, to be, they've to, they have to concentrate on, just the performance and nothing else, then minute the detail of the performance that they need to beat La Rochelle. I, ahead of the Toulouse game, I, I, I would have had my misgivings about where Leinster were and they came out and produced the performance that they produced uh, that day. I think that they are capable of winning. I have a sneaking suspicion in the same way that I felt prior to the Toulouse match that they will do it. But having said that, um, I I don't see where the bookies are coming from on this. I really don't. Like they made they made Leinster ten point favorites last year last year last week against Munster, so that didn't work out uh, too well. They're rarely wrong, twice. Um, I think that Leinster have to produce a performance that's better than anything they've produced this season. I think uh, Gordon's right in the sense that I think that they have to transfer that pressure to La Rochelle as defending champions. And I think that they have to play through 80 minutes and that they have to be quite fortunate with injuries. I, I think there are, there are two or three players that Leinster can't afford to lose during a game. Um, so my gut feeling is that they will squeak a win. But I think it'll be anything less than their best isn't going to be good enough. So, so you've outlined, Gordon, what they have to do as well as John. Um, can they do it and will they do it? Yeah, I think... Like for me, it is changing the picture. Um, if Leinster play any way, any way similar to what they have been playing in the in in the games, La Rochelle will just eat that up. I think it's a huge, uh, huge game for Jameson Gibson Park. Um, they absolutely can do it. They're underdogs is a great uh feeling with that. And as much as La Rochelle have been their Achilles heel. You know, when you beat teams and you're kind of thinking, yeah, we have the measure of them, you can't insulate from that mindset. Um, and Leinster need to find a way to do that. Can they? You know, I think my genuine uh, belief is they they can. 
Um, I'm struggling to see. I'm struggling. Uh, I'm a little bit more on the fence, and if anything, probably leading to a La Rochelle win. But I think um, I have faith in the in the uh, trickery of the, the machine of the Leinster coaches to find something a little bit different. Um, and Sean O'Brien, as much as anything else, keeping in the background. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for Leinster. And thank you both and enjoy the game.